we may have multiple layers of defenses in place, including antivirus or anti-malware software, both on hosts and servers. We may have next generation firewalls urgh, with application layer inspection, looking for and filtering out malware. However, these devices and systems, they could miss an attack because the attack, as of the time it's used, may be not yet known to the vendor or the general public. And that could be a new attack method, new malware, or a combination of both. And this is referred to as a zero day attack. And a lot of times it's helpful to use the internet as a resource tool and also third party products and vendors that are collecting. Like if we have a, an antivirus or anti-malware company that has thousands or hundreds of thousands of devices listening to the network, looking for malware and viruses and so forth, and then reporting it, it'd be awesome to leverage some of that. And part of that is proprietary. And then part of that is open source intelligence. This website, which is telosintelligence.com, is from Cisco Systems. It is their uh, cloud intelligence arm that they integrate in many of their products. They're just one of the vendors that do it. Uh, Checkpoint does it, Palo Alto does it, and other companies do it as well. But one of the features they have here under vulnerability information is they've got options for zero-day vulnerabilities. And that way, it's a place we could go to learn more about zero-day or brand new vulnerabilities that are hot off the press. And if we scroll down a little bit, I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. And if we scroll down a bit and click on view all zero day reports. So here it has zero day reports and disclosed vulnerability reports. And that's why it's so important to have defense in depth and multiple layers of security and not just rely on the attitude of, oh, it's crunchy and hard on the outside, like a firewall and then soft and chewy on the inside, because so many attacks happen inside. Because once an attacker compromises the network and gets in, or does social engineering and compromises a human and gets in, they can then use that device that they've compromised and pivot. And they can move laterally and find other devices to compromise and then continue the attack. So it's important to identify our vulnerabilities that we have, that we know about, put the appropriate countermeasures, which often involve hot fixes or patches or devices in front of our systems that are protecting them from the incoming attacks. And that's referred to as mitigation or defending or putting a control in place to help compensate for the vulnerability. So if we can get rid of the vulnerability altogether, that's awesome, best option. <laughs> but if we can't completely get rid of the vulnerability, we also might have some other type of a control like a firewall that could help defend against the vulnerability that the system or the application or the network has. So here under disclosed vulnerability reports, if we just grab one and click on it, it'll give us more details about it, including the CVE number, which stands for Common Vulnerability and Exposures. And then we can scroll down for additional information about this vulnerability. And so if we had Linux, for example, in our environment, a certain flavor of Linux running Apache and a certain flavor of that, and then there was a new vulnerability discovered hot off the press regarding that, we'd want to take steps to put in a countermeasure to help protect that system against that vulnerability. And then eventually when a patch is created and released, we'd want to apply the patch, which again reduces or removes the vulnerability on that system. So the concept of a day zero or zero day attack is that nobody knows until after the attack occurs and then the steps are taken to correct it. And that again is why having defense in depth with firewalls and intrusion prevention systems, IPS devices, both in the network and on the critical host and also using the concept or the idea of least privilege or least access and having those rules in place are essential. And that way the user isn't helping to propagate some vulnerability just based on you know too many privileges that they currently have as they're logged in. Another, while we're talking about users, practical end user training and verification that that training is taking place and that they understand, that is also critical to keeping our environments absolutely secure. Now, one of the reasons in general that vulnerabilities are so prevalent is gravity, like inertia. Like if there's a operating system that's been deployed as part of an Internet of Things device, maybe a real-time operating system or an older version of Linux or something, that people have just forgotten about or whatever, if it just sits there and then an attacker discovers, hey, I've got a million of these Internet of Things devices that are all running this version of Linux and it has this vulnerability, away they go uh, because it's the default. And oftentimes we forget about many of those things. Also, the configurations are often very, very weak because when a vendor deploys something, they want the user, the person who buys it, to be able to you know, bring it up, get it installed and have functionality. And their biggest concern is on functionality and not security. So one of the challenges is overcoming some of those default deployments, which have a weak configuration as a default or as a baseline. And that is what we are going to talk about in the next video. So I'll see you there 
in just a moment. Meanwhile, I hope this has been informative for you, and I'd like to thank you for viewing.